Hello, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to tell you why we have organized this event. And uh, as you know, at this moment, the climate change is an evidence nobody can deny, even Trump. The migratory species, spices and plants are changing habits, and these changes are producing a new phenomenon in the planet nobody can predict. Professor Valladares uh, has been vice, vice director uh, in a center of environmental science in Madrid, chair of the department of plant uh, physiology and ecology, senior uh, researcher in the plant ecology in Madrid as well. At the moment, he is uh, associate professor in this plant ecology in the University Rey Juan Carlos, a researcher uh, in the Center of Environmental Science in the CSIC, and director of the Chilean Spanish Global Change Laboratory. And Professor Valladares uh, share with us a useful, or is going to share with us a useful information about this uh, unpredictable planetary situation. And now, uh, with you, uh, he's going to to start his speech. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to be to be here. Thanks for the invitation, and hopefully the technology will allow us to communicate smoothly and, and easily. So, as Agustin mentioned in his introduction, the topic of today is really in the mouth and in the head of almost everyone in the in the world, or most people are actually thinking about it. And myself, as a researcher, will try to illustrate and to add some pieces of information and, and some ideas for, for discussion and for learning about a quite a timing issue, biodiversity and, and climate change. Obviously, it might be many ways of addressing this, this talk, but let me introduce a few concepts that we may need to have fresh in our minds. We are in a, in a moment in which biodiversity, the number of species, the richness, of a biological species is changing in most cases for the worst scenarios and uh, is in itself a factor of change. So biodiversity is changing things and is affected by the changes in other things. Changes in biodiversity are impacting the functioning of ecosystems and in turn the delivery of ecosystem services. So, when someone may ask, does biodiversity matter? The obvious answer is yes. And we may spend a few minutes in knowing or describing why does it matter. First, probably uh, it comes into our minds the idea of the functioning of the ecosystems. And we need to acknowledge that many of the processes and the properties of the ecosystems are influenced by the living organisms that makes those ecosystems. So biodiversity is actually at the core of the functioning of the ecosystems. And then another concept very related to that is the concept of ecosystem services, which are mostly or basically the benefits that people obtain from ecosystems. There are many kinds of uh, these sort of benefits, uh, or these services, uh, the provisioning services, the goods of the ecosystems, which are probably the first thing that comes to our mind, the wood, the food, the fiber, the fuels, pharmaceutical products, etc., and even the water, are some of those services. There are other more sophisticated or more subtle services like the regulating services that protect us against flooding or against erosion, provides the pollination of either wild plants or mm, uh, uh, crops, the water, the hydrological cycle, the purification of the water, the regulation of the climate, the regulation of disease, etc. And finally, or another important category, is the, are the cultural services, the spiritual, aesthetic values 
the recreation, the tourism, the scientific information that we get from the ecosystems, right? So basically, in my talk today, I will address two and probably a third idea as well. First, that biodiversity is threatened by climate change, threatening in turn many of these services that I've been mentioning, services that affect our lives as we know them. And then the changes and impacts of this climate change are here to stay. They are not predictions or remote future scenarios. They are already observed and they can be quantified in ecosystems. Other ideas that I want to illustrate today are that the species are obviously the bricks of biodiversity. They, they are uh, the, the very mm, bricks or the essential elements of biodiversity and as in turn the, the, the functioning of the ecosystems. And one idea that I want to, to illustrate today is the, 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 the notion that a species can be seen as alternative solutions to changing challenges. Climate change can be one, but there are other challenges, there are other changing factors, and different species behave, respond differently. So there are kind of uh, interesting potential uh, alternative solutions to these challenges. Another idea that is important to keep in mind is biodiversity is not only about the species, it also encapsulates and includes the of the variability that is within a given species, the intra-specific variability, the population level, even the individual level. And so the portfolio of these responses to climate change include uh, many aspects on local adaptation of the populations, plasticity, the capacity to respond of individuals that are uh, quite important and we are just beginning to, to uncover. And finally, as Agustin mentioned in the introduction, and we have in our minds for the, reasons, uh, the recent political situation, it is a, a, a topic, an issue that has many political, economical and social implications, far beyond the only functioning, ecological functioning of our planet. These days in Marrakech is taking place the COP, the Conference of the Parties number 22 on the climate change, and, and uh, it actually builds upon the agreement that was signed by almost 200 countries last year in Paris. But this agreement in Paris that finished with all these uh, voluntarily, uh, volunteer countries uh, signing the, the, the agreement is now threatened by a president of one of the two most important countries in terms of global emissions, that is the United States of America, and the now to be President Trump, really a person that is not um, agreeing with the conclusions of the International Panel on Climate Change, is not really taking into consideration the agreement, and is, uh, yesterday he was making some declarations that he's going to do all his efforts to stop the agreement of Paris. So it's really, it's really a, a hot issue. Uh, these beautiful images of uh, Paris uh, claiming for 100% renewable uh, scenarios in the near future are now threatened and of concern for many of us due to the surprise of this new potential uh, president of the United States of America. But let's go back to the scientific issue, the biodiversity and the climate change. Let me uh, illustrate, show some ideas. And first, I would like to, to explain a little bit what is called the insurance function of biodiversity. The fact that the diversity ensures some sort of stability in the ecosystems. Some species are able to resist disturbances, other species are able of uh, increasing the productivity of the ecosystems, and the combination of all these species makes, in general, more stable and more reliable the ecosystem functioning. There is an analogy to economics and is the so-called the portfolio effect. And it's a long-standing principle in economics that more diverse portfolios are less volatile and again quite a hot issue in the current economic crisis uh, all over the world. And because of the sum of many is less variable than the average item, right? This is the principle and the same applies to communities in, in nature, to species assembled in ecological communities. An interesting concept that is related to that and may explain why is that, is the so-called niche complementarity, the 
fact that each species plays a specific role in the ecosystem, has its own niche, so to speak. So the sum of all is much more efficient than the each individual species. It's more than the uh, exact addition of each. It's like a soccer team where each mm, member of the team plays a role and it's the entire team that benefits from the different complementary uh, roles uh, played by each individual player. When you analyze large data sets, like for instance the forest inventories, um, you, you see some clear relationships, clear patterns, that the higher the number of trees, for instance in these inventor inventories, the larger amount of different species, the increased richness or biodiversity, is associated with more productivity, with more growth, per, uh, expressed as tons of wood, for instance in this graph, no? and in others, uh, in other reviews, in other articles, it's been shown that in European forests from one to five species, the productivity increases as the number of three species increases as well. Recently, in October, a large group of scientists, including myself, published in, in Science a quite clear uh, paper with a clear message the positive biodiversity productivity, which I mentioned that some papers were, some articles and some previous research has uh, suggested, and we prove it for the so-called global forest that comes from a global, really large uh, data set of forests all over the world. In that study, we tested different relationships, mathematical functions that could explain productivity as a function of species richness, so P as a function of S, the production of wood, for instance, as a function of the number of species in the forest. No? And there are at least five important models, and the five were tested, and the one that was the most significant and, and, and better explained by the data set was the one in the middle showing a positive and concave down, but mostly positive, uh, relationship between productivity and species richness. And also, we prove that the opposite is true. So, a decline in biodiversity results in an accelerating decline in forest productivity. In the press release for this article, we made a, a sort of a statement uh, that could be grasped by the society. And uh, first of all, we identify ourselves. We were scientists from 90 institutions, so it's not a study done by a few uh, scientists somewhere. It's, it's really a global forest inventory assessment. Uh, tens of thousands of professionals were collecting data, in some cases for more than 100 years, and we collected data from almost a million plots, mm, uh, including in total almost three millions of trees of more than 9,000 or almost 9,000 species. This is just to give you an, a, a feeling for, for the, mm, the size of the, of the data set. The study obviously took into account all major types of forests. It's not the same a tropical forest, a Mediterranean forest, a deciduous temperate forest. They are different, they, they have different species, they have different properties. So we included them all just to see whether it was a general pattern, which, which was. In this global map of the world, we plot the, the decline in the productivity associated uh, to the decline in uh, uh, biodiversity, the species richness of the forest. And you can see in the, in the upper one, express the decline as a percentage. And in red, you see some forest in the very upper north part uh, showing high relative decline. And those uh, forests has, has a few species. They are relatively poor. And in, terms, in, re in relative terms, in percentage, the decline in productivity is associated with a sharp decline in species, but it only affects a few species. In the tropics, the situation is a little bit different because the tropics has, uh, are very species rich. So we can go to the lower map and see the absolute decline. In this case, expressed as cubic meters of wood per hectare per year. And you can see now that the picture is slightly different. And, and some areas like the Amazon basin and some uh, tropical forest in, the, in Asia are really, in absolute terms, reducing a lot their productivity in terms of, uh, as I mentioned, cubic meters of wood. So 
basically we can summarize this study as, uh, with a saying like, as far as go, so goes the economy. And we made some calculations uh, to see how much money is involved in that. And we calculated that the loss of productivity associated with the loss of a species richness or biodiversity is expected to be 500 billion per year across the world. Which for each of us is a lot of money, but globally speaking is not a lot of money. So again, you need to compare with something. And the, main, the, the, the most obvious comparison is with the cost that takes the conservation of the ecosystems uh, of all the air. And actually, this amount is more than double of the total cost to conserve ecosystems on the air. So basically, we are losing uh, more than double the total amount that we may put in the conservation of all the ecosystems of the world with this reduction in productivity due to the uh, loss of biodiversity. The, the, the main economic message of this study is that uh, the, the benefits far exceed, far exceed the cost of preserving. So obviously there are costs of preserving, but they are far more uh, or far less important than the economic revenue of keeping rich forests. Basically, uh, an associated conclusion is that the ongoing species loss in the global forest reduce, is reducing and will significantly reduce the productivity and thus the absorption of carbon dioxide by forest, which has obviously important implications for climate change. Another concept that I want to, to put on the table today is the notion of multifunctionality, the fact that most ecosystems in the world, if not all, uh, serve more than one function. They, they serve, in, in, at the same time, many functions. So we are interested as scientists, but also as citizens, to understand the provisioning of all these multiple functions at the same time. How these forests or these patches or these uh, ecosystems can serve many purposes and not only just one. In a recent paper that we published uh, this year in, in Nature Communications, we summarized all the data that we've been collected, collecting in different European forests uh, with a simple design, simple experimental design. We were comparing in each country forests composed by one species, by two species, by three species, by four species, by five species. And then we were measuring functions of one type, functions of another type, functions of X types. And we were seeing what was the pattern. And obviously we were, I'm saying obviously because we expected that from the previous uh, preliminary studies, that the more species you have, the more functions you can have on the same, very same forest patch. So basically the take home message of that study that can get a little complicated in the details, but the, the main message is, is rather straightforward, is that we prove multifunctionality increasing with biodiversity. The more species you have in the forest, the more functions you can provide. And this relates to, a, or I would like to relate it to, to one classic study done by Rockstrom and collaborators that nowadays are even located in a, in a research center in Stockholm that is called the Stockholm Resilience Center. They published some years ago a very challenging paper talking about the uh, ecological or not ecological, the, the planet limits, whether our planet has uh, some quantifiable uh, limits and we can then see how far are we from these limits, whether we are in the safe uh, side of, uh, of, those, of those threats or whether we have surpassed those limits and we are in a risky, very risky situation. They, they define nine main hazards, main problems, climate change being one of them, but the biodiversity loss in itself being another one, plus others like, uh, for instance, uh, important cycles like the nitrogen or the phosphorus cycles, or the freshwater use, or the ozone dep depletion in the stratosphere, or the ocean acidification. For each of them, they identify a number of variables, and then they, they estim estimated how far are we from the safe limits. And for climate change, we have surpassed the green, the green or safe region, but we are still in a point at which we could perhaps 
go back. But for the biodiversity loss, we are really far from the safety uh, operating limits, and we, we have lost way too many species to, uh, to, to recover normal functioning of systems. Last week, another group of scientists uh, coordinated by Sheffers published in Science an interesting review. It's actually uh, one of those papers that can have a long-lasting influence because he summarized the, fruit, the footprint of climate change at different scales, going from genes to biomes to actual people. They summarized hundreds and, in some cases, thousands of papers and articles and, and studies, and they organized the information in different levels, like organisms, individual organisms, species, populations, and ecological communities. And they, they quantify the percentage of cases, the percentage of ecological processes, the, the, the percentage of levels of biological organizations already affected by climate change. And the numbers are really high. The, as you can start seeing in this, in this graph, in most cases, more than half, in some cases even 70, 80 percent of the, of the cases, were showing impacts of climate change, were showing processes that were affected by climate change directly. Just to give you some examples, at the organism level, they were exploring the genetic diversity, the activity of individuals, the body size or the shape of the body. At the species level, the range, size and location of the species, the quantity and quality of the habitats for the species. At the population level, the recruitment, the regeneration, the age structure, the abundance, the capacity for migration. At the community level, productivity, things like the ones that we've been talking about, the interactions among species, the composition, and many, I, I, I told you, 82% uh, uh, of the 94 ecological processes studied in detail, 2% of them were showing significant uh, evidence of impacts, direct impacts by climate change. They also made a distinction between types of ecosystems, whether they were marine, freshwater, or terrestrial. They were slightly different uh, percentages in each ecosystem, but the main message you can go into the details in this graph and other associated graphs in the original publication that, as I mentioned, is very recent. It was actually published last week. Um, in all cases, the numbers, the fractions, the percentage of processes uh, affected are, are more than half, in between 60 and 80 percent in most cases. Again, to illustrate this with a few examples, for instance, um, in, at the genetic level, uh, Processes like the adaptive evolution to heat stress is a small, in smaller organisms with short generation time has been shown to be affected. Uh, there is limited evidence for adaptive evolution. At the physiological level, there is an increase in coral disease or extensive uh, problems affecting these, these corals and the mechanisms has been in, de in detail studied in some other uh, papers. There are mortality events. Uh, there are m many uh, symptoms of the problems suffered directly by the corals. In the morphology, for instance, decrease in body size and, and shape in many in, uh, types of organisms, like, for instance, uh, insects. Mm -hmm. The phenology, the fact that the timing of the events is changing, has been shown extensively. Uh, the flowering, the, produ the production of fruits, but also the timing of the migratory birds, for instance, have, is already affected, and will be in the future even more affected. The dynamics of the populations, of the, for instance, herbivores or rabbits, or, is affected by climate change. The distribution, the current distribution of the species is affected. The species are moving toward warmer, uh, excuse me, toward colder uh, habitats, either in latitude or in altitude. They are moving and the ranges has been quantify and there are interesting studies showing that. And the finally interesting uh, aspect of the relationships, the relationships among species are affected. So 
The paper finishes with a table that is uh, interesting, intriguing, challenging, and quite important, and it's showing the impacts and the consequences for humans. Uh, and again, it goes from the level of organism to the level of community. And there are um, aspects uh, related to diseases, uh, to the distribution of uh, fisheries, freshwater fisheries or marine uh, fishes that are of use for us. The human, human health is affected at different levels and, and there are proofs for that. So again, you can go to table one on that paper in, in science published last week and, and get more, more details on that. But the main message is that there are many aspects affected by, by, by climate change directly and it's been quantified and there are proofs for that and all sorts of details on the mechanisms. So let me go a little bit into, into some examples on, of research applied to, in this case, a group of organisms, to, to trees, in the case of Europe, so uh, European trees. Those maps I'm showing here are visual representations of the functional diversity of European forest. How, how diverse are they in terms of the functions they provide? The, the color actually represents the future change, whether this functional diversity is going to be higher or lower. In red, when the functional diversity is decreasing, and in, in green, when it is increasing. So the climate change is bringing to southern Europe a species from North Africa, for instance. So some uh, rich, uh, some some increase in species is, is expected because we we get some immigrants, some species that loves warmer places, and the the northern parts of Europe sometimes they get or some immigrants from warmer places. But as you can see in this map, for most Central Europe and even for some areas in the Iberian Peninsula and the Scandinavian Peninsula, the uh, future is not very optimistic. Obviously, we want to understand better these maps. These are projections and we want to, to see how realistic are these maps, whether the species can be just plotted and the functional diversity calculated uh, without taking into consideration more things. And because the scientists, we tend to communicate among us, we, we meet in workshops, in congresses, uh, and, and then we combine our results, our science uh, is done in, with different techniques and approaches. In some cases, we, we go for satellite images, in other cases, we go for mathematical modeling, in other cases, we go for physiological measurements of the trees. And then we want to see how much of agreement is between these different studies. In some cases, there is disagreement, and it's interesting to understand why. When you study the trees at a physiological level, you get different results than when you study the trees from a satellite, and you see that they move or they don't move as you expect, or these, these discrepancies. No? And uh, here I'm showing a few illustrations of a typical Mediterranean forest in Catalonia, near Barcelona. It's been studied extensively, and in this uh, mountain range called Montseigne, there is a, a detailed description of how the vegetation, dominated by a uh, nevergreen oak, Quercus ilex, is moving up here. And in the upper part, there is this uh, beech forest. There is a, a small patch of beech in this Mediterranean uh, climate area, and the beeches are reaching the top, and they cannot go farther from the top. So uh, if the whole oak is pushing from down below the, the, the beach forest is, is eventually will get extinct. The maps at different scales, like the large, large scales versus these aerial photographs or reconstructions at the more local scales, they don't match very well. And sometimes you see a tendency for the large scale maps to be a little bit more pessimistic. They, they render scenarios that are uh, more pessimistic. When you go to the place, actual place, or you see more local photographs and you reconstruct the last decades of history at the local level, there are, in general, I'm, I'm saying this as a generalization that obviously has some exceptions, you see less extinctions, you see movements of the vegetation that are a little bit less extreme than when you extrapolate and make simulations at very large, large scale. Why is that? We think we have a battery of potential answers to that. One answer is actually hidden in the wood, in the very wood of the trees. You have the history, 
you have the the life of that tree that can be 80 years old, 100 years old, 200 years old, and by measuring all these rings in the wood, you can see how much it grew 10 years ago, 50 years ago, and reconstruct the history of that tree. And by adding one tree, another tree, and different species, you can make a kind of a movie of how the forest was performing and growing over the last century or so. And this very simple schematic graph illustrates a case for the beech, Fagus sylvatica. If you see the, 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 the graph, you can, you can see the, 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 the relationship between the, grow, the, the altitude at which the growth is optimum. You can see that in the early 70s, the altitude at which the growth was optimum was around 450 meters or 400 and something, a few, uh, let's say, low elevation. The beaches are still there in the same places, but if you go 40 years later, you see that the altitudinal growth optimum is much higher. The individuals that are growing better are 100 meters higher. The beach itself has not disappeared from low elevations, but is not performing as well as those that are in upper uh, sites. That may explain why some different studies show slightly different results. Beach is not extinct which is not disappearing yet, but is not performing well in low altitudes. If you take all, all, another view, another kind of study to, to this forest, and you go to the demography, to the age classes. So you see the juveniles, the adults, senescent individuals. You see how many of them are at different elevations. You can see things like this one, for instance, illustrated for, by, for Pinus sylvestris, the Scott pine. This pine it's actually showing a relatively wide altitudinal range. It's present from, let's say, 1,000 meters to almost 2,000 meters of elevation all over Europe. Obviously, if you go northern, it, it is at the sea level, but in the south of Europe, you, you need to go to the mountains, as is in the case of Spain. And if you see the, 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 the plot that I'm showing here as an example, is the total number of seedlings and saplings in each sampling place over elevation. And you see that there is a tendency to be maximum at middle uh, elevations with lower numbers at the two extremes. But if you compare the red and the black lines, you see that the optimum for seedlings is lower than the optimum for saplings. Let's say the maximum value of the maximum numbers of saplings is at higher elevation than the uh, maximum observed for seedlings. Seedlings are current year. They have just germinated. They are very vulnerable to whatever happens that very first summer. And they will be killed by warm or dry conditions very easily. And you can see that in the lower elevation, you still see seedlings just germinating, but you don't see saplings, which are the two, three, four years juveniles of pines. And they are present at higher elevation. The pine itself is all over the range. But there is no regeneration, actual regeneration, in the very low, low end of this elevation gradient. Well, just to mention uh, an important issue that has been monitored for a long time, even the Chinese scientists, uh, the Greek scientists, the Egyptian scientists, all of them has been recorded for thousands of years the timing of the events. You know that in Japan, the time for some trees to flower is almost a national holiday. So phenology, the timing of the events, has been recorded by humans for centuries or millennia. So we have an extensive database. And we can make, again, measurements, means, statistics on those databases, and see uh, mean values no? to get a, an idea of how global are the changes in, in phenology. And basically, just to show few numbers on this extensive data set of, of, of phenology, we can see that the mean number of days changed per decade is, on average, about four or five days. It means that regardless of whether you are a tree or a bird or an amphibian or an insect, on average, you tend to anticipate your development, your activities, about four or five days each 10 years, each decade. 
and this is very significant, and this has been recorded all over the world. This is taking place already. This has been recorded even by kids at school, just taking notes on their trees in their uh, playground. Uh, so it's a very global phenomenon. It's a very simple phenomenon to explain and to describe and to quantify, but it's very complex to to describe in terms of mechanisms and just to illustrate how something that may sound simple is in fact very complicated is uh, the mismatch between experiments and observations. In this graph published in Nature four years ago, the, the scientists compare the flowering and the leafing or the production of leaves in a large data set and the, in, in experiments versus observations and the difference are about three four Days. We don't understand why. Why, when you do experiments, you tend to get less of a phenological change than when you make observations. It's just to illustrate that we scientists, we don't pretend to understand everything. We don't pretend to know everything. We have some pieces of evidences, and this is what I'm showing you today. So basically, we are in, a, in an area that is called Anthropocene, because the human, anthropos, are changing to a significant stage, the uh, planet in which we live. The novelty of this global change are two, basically, it, it's a two-sided novelty. First, is the first time on the history of the planet that it, a single species is having such an impact, because obviously photosynthetic organisms had an impact, uh, diatoms, unicellular organisms, the dinosaurs, if you want, as a group, had an impact. But one single species, human beings, is the first time that one single species has this large global impact. And the other novelty is the speed of the change. So far, we have not uh, been able to record, to quantify uh, such a quick environmental change as the environmental change triggered by human activities nowadays in the 20th and 21st century. So if you, if you have a, an, a species, an individual, in this case, on this graph, a whole moke in the middle, uh, you have to see a lot of pressures on it. Pressures due to global change, the increased atmospheric CO2 concentration, reduced precipitation, pollution. And this organism, or this species, or this population, is then trying to do something, responding in some way or another. One thing is to migrate. Well, there are also barriers to migration. Migration is not as easy. It happens with human beings. We know that in the Mediterranean and in other areas. Know that we human beings are suffering difficulties, are experiencing difficulties in migrating. Well, plants and animals, wild species, also have a lot of additional problems uh, to, to migration. Additional, I mean, caused by human activities, for instance, land use changes and fragmentation that impose limitations for the migration, impose limitations to dispersal. But also, if the species is, let's say, in the process of evolving, of making a quick evolution, changing, adapting uh, uh, to, to the new environmental conditions, there are problems that are uh, slowing down this potential evolution. One of them is the uh, genetic diversity of the populations that, in, in many cases, is decreasing. So there are less chances for the species to evolve quickly. There are less individuals and less a genetic variability in the populations to evolve. No? And then there are possibilities like the so-called phenotypic plasticity, or the capacity to, to, to accommodate your phenotype, to your, your, your feature, your physiology, your behavior, your physiology, or whatever feature, uh, to accommodate to, to new conditions. And we know that there are limits to plasticity. So plasticity is not the magic solution. It is a solution, and in some cases allows the populations to survive, but it's not magic. It has some limits. So I'm coming to the end of this. We could have talked about many aspects. As you can imagine, this is a very um, wide topic. There are many concepts related to the ideas I presented today. And hopefully, you've been able to make your own conclusions. And probably, you are able to combine the information that I provided today with your own information. You make your own uh, set of take-home messages. I'm summarizing five here, but we could develop more if you want in the discussion later on. For instance, one thing is that sometimes we move too quickly to future species scenarios, 
uh, and the species level is very attractive for politicians, for citizens, and even for scientists. But we don't understand very well intraspecific species, I mean, intraspecific uh, processes, population level processes, processes that occurs at the individual level or within populations, within species, can be very important. We are beginning to understand some of them, but they are way, way too complicated to make sound models and sound predictions uh, taking into account them. So a little bit of warning into moving to species predictions and species scenarios. And the second conclusion is related to that. Our knowledge on genetic diversity, the genetic information, the value of that genetic diversity, the phenotypic plasticity that I mentioned briefly a few minutes ago, other aspects on the physiology and the performance of those populations that are fragmented. We can talk about the case of trees, but we can probably expand this knowledge and these generalizations to other organisms as well. Uh, our knowledge is particularly fragmented or limited, mm -hmm. and we don't know much about what uh, is going on at some extreme populations where there are, it might be genetic novelty, genetic possibilities for uh, achieving solutions, we don't know yet. Models, models as the ones I show in that map of Europe with these green and red areas are predictions, are mathematical representations of what we think will happen with biodiversity in new, uh, under new climates, but they are models. Obviously they are useful, they provide useful results, uh, they provide maps in the case of the models I show, but they provide quantitative outputs that can be used by politicians or by citizens to take decisions, but they are limited. They are sometimes not as realistic as we would like them to be, because we don't know the details, we don't have sometimes enough biological information. So again, a little bit of warning with the models. They are the best that we have, but we have to make them better. And monitoring. Monitoring is crucial. Sometimes it's boring because you just measure, 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 and store the measurements, store the data, keep the data, but it's crucial. Unless we keep the monitoring uh, in all sorts of key variables, key parameters, we will not be able to determine the speed of the change, the magnitude of the change, whether we are entering in really new conditions or the conditions are has been experienced by the planet before, and so it's crucial mm, to, to, to do a sound monitoring, and this has to be afforded by countries and by big, big uh, institutions. So finally, the last conclusion that I mentioned at the beginning as one of the key messages is that climate change is having an impact in many aspects, biodiversity being one of them, and it's having an impact right now. We will wait for more refinements to conclude that climate change is is here to stay, is having a, an impact, and we are, uh, some of us more than others, suffering the impacts of this climate change. So I finish with this, and I hope I managed to provide some clear messages to you, and I will be happy to take questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Fernando. Uh, it has been a, a very interesting speech, and now I open the, the train of questions. If you like to talk, you can click on the little man at the toolbar. And if you are in class like uh, Helena, <laughs> You, you can write on the chat, your question on the chat. Yeah, Ulrike. Ulrike? Hello, Ulrike? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, you can hear me now? Okay. Yes, yes, I can. Oh. Okay. Um, I've got a question because um, you mentioned also um, the acidification of the ocean um, on this mm -hmm. uh, one, um, yeah, on this picture. And uh, mm -hmm. my question is 
um, this is um, a big threat for uh, for the humans because if we um, lose all these, uh, I think, small animals in the sea who produce the oxygen for for us in uh, Europe or so on, this is uh, more threatened um, as uh, other things of um, yeah climate change mm -hmm. because um, I think um, sometimes I think if if we in Europe for instance if we, we if we got the climate change and it's getting perhaps colder because of the um, Gulf Stream if the, if the Gulf Stream is stopping so we're getting colder wo colder weather maybe and mm -hmm. um, but I think the um, acidi acidification of the ocean um, is really threatening because this is what we can't uh, stop because uh, carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere and methane and all these things. Yeah. What do you think about it? Yeah, it's actually a very important aspect. I mean, the, what happens in the ocean, then it multiplies by such a large surface and eventually volume that has a, a, a very important uh, impact on the planetary functioning. No? And, and the acidification of the, the ocean is is having a direct impact on coral reefs and in many tropical areas you can see that and so the functioning of those uh, tropical ecosystems is significantly and dramatically affected right now and uh, the, the, the calculations or the simulations on how this will in the long term affect the functioning of the entire eco uh, marine or ocean ecosystems are rendering a little scary numbers because as you mentioned they, they, they perform a functioning and, and uh, function as service on carbon sequestration and provisioning of food for us on fishes and, and biodiversity is very much dependent on, on the well uh, uh, health, on the good health of the, of the oceans. So acidification is an actual problem that is not affecting only the tropical ecosystems. You can see the tropical ecosystems right now, but it's affecting all the global ocean. Um, Elena would like to know what can we do at the school to mm -hmm. tackle this global problem. Do you have any advice? Yeah, well, my first advice, I've been involved sometimes in, in teaching this uh, to kids at school. I, I would like, I would like to, to be, not to be too catastrophic, not to sound like the tragedy and the end of the world. I will try to avoid that kind of message to the kids, to the, even to the teenagers. Yeah, I think we we cannot also we cannot either uh, lie them and say no nothing happens obviously but we should uh, present always that there are alternatives and uh, we 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 have to take decisions the decisions must be taken the sooner the better and the decisions uh, corresponds to the type of life that we want to live uh, I think this is the kind of message we can illustrate with examples I presented today or others how fast the things are affected and are changing due to the human activity, the climate change and other environmental impacts that we are having on the, on the environment. But I think we need to emphasize on the possibility that there are still many possibilities to change our direct impact and, and to take decisions uh, on, on what kind of world we want in the future and, and, act to, uh, act, uh, and make an action right now. Um, Aranzazu would like to know, well, I would like you to explain what uh, phenology is. Phenology is a, is a term to describe all things that are having a time dimension. For instance, when you produce flowers, you can produce flowers in May or in June, or you can produce it one week eight, earlier or later. Or when you produce fruits, you, you also there is a timing for the fruits but also there is a timing for the birds, the migratory birds, to, to arrive to a place or to leave a place, or some insects to, uh, to take place, to appear, to, to, to show up or, or not. The timing of those events is affected by, by warming, by climate in general, by, by warming in particular. So many things are advancing. Uh, because we are in a warmer world, things tend to be taking place earlier. The, the trees are flowering a week, 10 days, 15 days earlier than they used to flower or produce leaves uh, half a century ago.
I don't hear Ulrike. Ulrike? Uli? Uli? Would you like to ask a question? Yeah, I hear, I'm hearing you. You can hear me. Okay. Yes. Can I, I, I just yes. want to say one thing? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, I also saw the movie from Leonardo DiCaprio and Before mm. the Flood. It was very impressionist and uh, really nice to see. And there was one sentence, and I think it's, it's really important that we teachers know that we, we have to bring the education not just to the students, also to the parents of them. Because mm -hmm. they, they told about, uh, I, I think it was Sweden, where the students and the, stu um, the, the parents changed the government or changed the way of the mm -hmm. government. So, and I think this is really, really important to know to all teachers. We mm -hmm. have not just influence to our students to create okay. them projects or things. We have also more influence to, to educate um, the society. And this yes. is one point where we can, can do something very good and we can be strong. Nowadays, mm -hmm. in Germany, we, we had a lot of struggle because our c climate plan from our government, from our um, environmental minister, she, she, uh, this was a very good plan and they um, developed the plan with citizens, with scientists, and then the government mm -hmm. tried to stop it. And uh, even my students wrote to our government, to our chancellor, to, to a lot of ministers, and they are mm -hmm. eight till ten years old. So it was, it was really nice. And now we get responding. And so you have to, yeah, um, give your give uh, some some I think um, chance to your students or some some yeah. power and say yes, do something, say something. We we have the right. It's our future. So yes. I think uh, they can do something good. Yeah, I think you said it wonderfully. I, I really agree with what you said. It's very important to transmit this message. And I will add to what you said that we, we need to separate personal beliefs, religion, trust, uh, confidence in supernatural powers, to, to set those things aside, to keep respect for them, but to, to tell the kids and the society, the parents and everyone, that there are some scientific repetitive, clear, objective, quantify impacts on aspects that cannot be denied by anyone. This is not a question I, I believe in, in the gravity or in the solar system. I don't believe or not believe. It's not a question of believing. It's not a question associated to personal uh, ways of life. There are scientific fundings or foundations to, to show that there are things that are changing and also scientific reasoning to support some actions and some other actions. I think this is very important, not, not to mix those aspects of climate change with uh, beliefs and personal lifestyles or, or, or things like that. Okay, is there any other question? Just before finishing the, the webinar. Well, I remind you that tomorrow we'll talk about about, about the palm trees rainforest situation with Uli, uh, Ulrike Schmidt, with, uh, which is with us to, today as well. And the following day, on Thursday, we'll have a, a, a forum about this uh, problem and how to organize actions or, or campaigns around this situation, this problem, to work at the school. So, um, I would like you, th thank you very much, Fernando. My pleasure. Yeah, um, thank you. And it, it, would, it will be the first, but not the, the, the last time we, you are with us. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, yeah. You will be very welcome. Thank you for mm -hmm. giving uh, lights and answers to uh, many questions. And I hope uh, again you you would like to, the speech about the biodiversity and climate change. And I wait you tomorrow. Okay. Thank you very much to all of you. Bye bye.